Listen, I have a, I, I've got so much to cover, and I'm, and I'm intent on covering it. We are transitioning into a, a, a different aspect of uh, all that God's called us to do this year. We are winding down uh, in our 2021, a year of rebuilding. Ezra uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through, uh, 1 through 11, chapter 2, verses 1 through 70, and chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. So we are, we are uh, on, we're winding down. We're coming to the close and to the end of that. And so uh, as we prepare ourselves this year uh, or in this month to continue as we close out. Uh, we have two items and two uh, focuses for this month, the month of November. We have both uh, divine count, which you're going to talk about today and, and next week. And then we have divine unity, which we'll cover and talk about in the last two weeks of November. And then we'll move into our last focal for the year. And that will be divine worship. Divine worship It's going to take us the whole month of December. I just want you to know divine worship is not divine worship is not just worshiping, but it's worshiping on a whole nother plane, a whole nother level. It's not worshiping when you ask God to come down to you. I'm talking about worship that causes you to ascend and go where he is. And so it's going to be, it's going to be a different uh, uh, discussion. It's going to be a different type of worship that I'm believing God that we enter into not worship as we have come to know it. How many of you feel still in your worship? And what I mean when I say that is that we go through the the uh, uh, we go through the uh, uh, the motion of worship. You know, we 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 because we do it week after week and time after time. It becomes monotonous. It becomes mundane. It becomes routine in such in, in such a way in such a manner that that you and I uh, that we go through uh, all the the actions of worship, but we don't feel the same way that we felt uh, when we when, when we had we were introduced to our first love, the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to understand that this divine worship is going to take you to another place, another height, another tier in him. It's going to take you somewhere. So, so, but we, we're going to start here at divine count. We're going to do, we're going to stay here for two weeks unless the Lord says something different. And then we're going to go to divine unity uh, and stay there for two weeks unless the Lord says something different. And then we're going to utilize the entire month of December for divine worship. As we close out the year, the Lord has already given me the, the word of, of the Lord for next year. Amen. And it's going to surprise some of you all. And I, I'm going to share it with our leaders. I ain't going to tell you what it is yet, um, but I'm going I'm to share it with our leaders so they can prepare themselves and get the people ready as we transition and cross over uh, from the old year into the new. Amen. And so, again, uh, as we talk about divine count, chapter uh, chapter two, verses one through 70, uh, talk about the people and the resources. The whole congregation is numbered 42,360. But I want you to understand that everybody didn't go. All of the Israelites didn't go. And so there was a divine count where the Lord picked and selected who he wanted to go. There was a divine count. God is very purposeful, purpose, purposeful, purposeful in his selection of who goes and when they go. Because you don't go in this season, don't, doesn't mean you'll never go. It just may not be the time. But those who are counted, those who are selected by God, the Lord has, has counted you and selected you to go. What a shame it would be for the Lord to select you and you stand still, not even knowing that you've been called. So we're going to talk about some things today, and I want to rehearse some things in your hearing because God's speaking to us even in divine count. I don't want you to lose heart. I don't want you to lose focus. I don't want you to uh, uh, misunderstand what God is doing in the rebuilding season. There's some of us that have to stay back in garrison. You'll understand I'm a military man, 10 years in the military. I want you to understand that everybody doesn't go out to battle. There are people that stay in garrison. There are people at garrison is the camp behind the battle, the camp that's far away from the battle. So there are individuals who stay in garrison and they prepare and they help to strategize. They help to communicate. They send supplies and resources to those who are in battle. So you have to have some people to stay back in order to facilitate and help those who are in the battle. But there comes a time when those who are in garrison, then they, they make the transition from garrison into the battle. So I want you to understand divine count. I want you to understand that there are seasons and times when God uses us in different ways. But when he calls you, be on the ready. When he calls your name, when he says to you, I want 
you to do this. I want you to do that. I want you to go here and say to the people this. When the Lord calls you, you need to be on the ready. Amen. So, so I'm going to share with you. I want to read this. Judges chapter 7. Grab your Bibles and, and turn your Bible, your Bible app, whatever you look at, at the word on. Uh, I, I got it on my, my, uh, my iPad. I got it on my phone. I know there's many devices. Technology is wonderful today. And so, so you know, I can pull up all different translations and all that kind of stuff. So it's great. So grab your Bible. There is, if you got a phone, you ought to have a Bible. If most of y'all got phones, I'm talking from the youngest to the oldest. If you got a phone, you got a Bible. Judges chapter 7. I'm going to read verses 1 through 7 real quick. Verses 1 through 7. And the word of the Lord reads this way. Early in the morning, Jerobel, that is Gideon, and all his men camped at the spring of Harad. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the, near the hill of Moray. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into your hands or Israel should boast against me saying this. My own strength has saved me. Now announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. And so 22,000 men left while 10,000 remained. But the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many. Now, let me just park there for a minute. I know I'm just reading the text, but I got to park there because I want to make sure you understand what has just happened. There were 32,000 soldiers, 32,000 men. And the Lord said to Gideon, make this announcement. All of you who tremble in fear, go home. And the Bible says that 22,000 of them. Now, it would have been okay if it was 22 of them. It would have been okay if it was 220. It would have been all right if it was 2,020. But 22,000, which is more than two-thirds of, he- of what had gathered there, got up and left. Now, I don't know about you, but if I am in charge of the army and I see two-thirds of the soldiers get up and just leave, I'm going to have a problem. Because I want you to understand in retrospect that the army of the Midianites was 135,000 soldiers. So we already at 32,000, we're already, uh, uh, the odds are against us. 32,000, but then 22,000 of them leave. Leaving now only 10,000 against 135,000 thousand soldiers so 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 now i want you to i want you to understand that in the context of this because then god says after the twenty-two thousand left while ten thousand remain listen to this but the lord said to gideon there are still too many men he said there's still too many men take them down to the water and I, he says listen to this i will thin them out for you there if i say one shall go with you he shall go But if I say that this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So Gideon took the men down to the water. There uh, there the Lord told him, separate those who lap the water with their tongues as a dog laps. And separate them from those who kneel down to drink. So he said, we're going to have two two groups. The first group are those who, 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 who cup the water in their hands and begin to lap the water like dogs. He says, separate those from the, uh, 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 this group who, 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 who kneels down, who kneels down to drink. <laughs> and the Bible says that 300 of them drank with cupped hands, lapping like dogs. All the rest got down on their knees to drink. So of the 10,000 that were left, 7,700 Got down on their knees. Now, now it's interesting because you would think that those who would get down on their knees, if, if, if I'm talking to the real spiritual people today, those who would get down on their knees, that is a position whereby we pray. That is a position whereby you and I, we get down and we, when we make our petitions known to the Father, normally we get down on our knees. When we go into our private place of prayer, that is normally a place where we get down on our knees. That is normally the posture, the posture of prayer. 
But God said he didn't pick those. He didn't select those who got down on their knees. He selected those who cupped the water and began to lap. Like dogs, because I'm come, I've come to understand some things. Uh, uh, that, that positions, positions will fool you, yeah. and people in positions will fool you, yeah. because there is a there is a type, there is a is, is a form, there's a fashion of godliness that people have, but there's no power therein. Folk can be down on their knees, but they ain't saying nothing. Folk can be down on their knees, but and you can see their mouths moving, but their prayers don't hit the, they don't go past the ceiling of the room. I'm just trying to help you understand, don't you be caught up in position. Oh, I'm saying that to somebody. That ain't even the point. I just, I, that's the Holy Ghost. Don't you be caught up in position. Don't you be caught up in your position, and certainly don't be caught up in somebody else's position. So, so, so the Bible says, this is what it says. Let me get back. 300 uh, of them drank with cupped hands, laughing like dogs. All the rest uh, got down on their knees to drink. And the Lord said this to Gideon. He said, with the 300 men that have left, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Listen to this. Let the others go home. Let the others Go home. I know, I know, I know, uh, 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 we, we seem to be outnumbered and I know we seem to be outmatched and I know they got 135,000 warriors and, and you're saying we just going to fight them with 300. And the Lord says, let the others go home with God. Can they, can they just stay right here? Just in case. Can they stay in close proximity? Just in case. You know, we might need a plan B. God doesn't need a plan B. So God says, so that I can show them who God really is, tell them to go back home. We ain't got no plan B. All we got is God. And I'm wondering today if God is enough in your plan. I wonder today, is God enough in your plan or do you have to factor in, I need a plan B and I need a plan C. And if so-and-so don't show up and if so-and-so don't help me, I got to fall back and I know who else I can call. And if they can't help me, I know who else can call, who else can call. The, the truth of the matter, do you trust God to be enough where there's no plan B necessary? He said, let all the others go home. That's the word of the Lord. Listen, just for, for sake of title that you can go back and reflect on. The title is divine count. What was left is all that you need. What was left is all that you need. You may not even agree, but it doesn't matter. What is left is all that you need. Need you may not even see it, but what is left is all that you need. What is left will show you that God is God. What is left will show you that there is a God that sits on the throne. What it will show you with what is left is God is still in control. And I know that's challenging. Because we got 300 folk, and I don't know about you, but 300 folk is a challenge. I'm going to tell you something. I want to share something else with you. Because whatever, what else is a challenge is when you learn a little bit more about Gideon. So the Bible says, and, and write this down, write this down. Make sure that you always have pen and paper. Write this down. In the sixth chapter, the sixth chapter, the 15th verse of Judges. The chapter right before the chapter, the chapter uh, uh, of our focus today, chapter 7. The 6th chapter, verse 15, this is what it says. Because God calls Gideon. God calls Gideon. I want you to understand a little bit of backdrop. God calls Gideon. There's, there is a why to what's going on. There is a why to what's happening. And I want you to get this. I want you to get down in your spirit. Because if you look at Judges chapter 6, verses 1 through, through 10, the word, of, the word of the Lord says that Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. See, see we think that, 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 that things happen just... And we, we, we say stuff like, you know, you know, uh, uh, you know this happened and, and, and you know, 
and, 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 and you know, I don't understand why is this happening to me and, and why, is, you know, why is God doing this to me? But the truth of the matter is the Bible says that the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. This is what it says. And it says, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, listen to this, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain cliffs, caves, and strongholds. It was tough. It was, it was, it, 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 they, they were so oppressive. The Bible says that, that, that uh, the Midianites camped in the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel. In other words, it says that as Israel uh, began to plant crops, that the Midianites would come in and take their crops and kill all of their cattle, kill all of their sheep. It says, it says that, 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 that they, they camped in the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither the sheep nor the cattle nor the donkeys. It says they came up with their livestock in their tents, listen to this, like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them or their camels because the, the number was so great. They invaded the land to ravage it, to destroy it. I want you to understand, but I want you to get this part because the Israelites cried and they cried out to the Lord because of a Midian. But this is what, what happened. The Bible says that he sent them a prophet. He sent a prophet. To them, as a result of their cry, he sent a prophet who said this. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians. I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and I gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the God of the Amorites in the land which you live. He says, but you have not listened to me. You begin to worship the gods of the lands that you lived in. That's interesting because, because while, while we don't live in Midian and while we're not in the Middle East, we certainly live in a land where there are idols all around us. And so I've got to ask you, is, is your hold up because you're worshiping the idols of your land. I've got to ask you, what are you worshiping that you've placed and put ahead and before God that has caused him now to bring you into a place of captivity? Where he's caused you to, to be brought into a place. I want you to get this. Because God did not destroy uh, the crops. He did, not, he did not prevent the crops from growing as they sowed and the crops came up. He just brought somebody in to consume what they have sown. So you sown and it's reaped the harvest. But the, the enemy that God has released in your life because you have idols in the land in which you live have now come in and begin to devour and ravish the harvest that should rightfully be yours. Because you have, because you have worshipped the idols of your land. What are the idols of your land? It's interesting because, because you know, we have different things. We, we have different things that we say is not an idol. But, but, but see, the truth of the matter is God looks and God knows not just what you do, but he also knows the intent behind what you do. And so, and so he looks at what's important to you. And he looks at where he stands in light of what's important to you. And he looks to see where he is in priority. He looks to see where you give your time. And do you give more time to stuff? And do you give more time to things? Then you give to him. And then that would say to me that, that, that what is priority is the thing that you give more time to. There is nothing. There is nothing. There is no thing that I give more of my time uh, to than I give to my wife. I don't give more time to my children. I don't give more time to my job. Now, I work and I work hard. But the truth of the matter is I'm always checking on her. I say, hey, sweetheart, I'm going to go into the meeting. You good? You need anything? She's sitting right here. She can tell you. I always make sure I alert her, let her know I got this meeting from this time to this time. 
time and I'm going to go in this meeting. If you need me, if she needs me, she can be out and she'll call me. She'll text me. Are you in the meeting? I will come out of the meeting to, if, to find out what's going on and what she needs because she is my priority in the earth. She is my priority. She is the thing. She is my good thing that God has given to me. And so I have a responsibility to her such that I please him. And so I want you to understand the very thing that he looks at. He begins to look at first and foremost where you spend your time and in, 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 in retrospect to how much time you spend with him. It's interesting because we were, we were listening to, as we listened to uh, 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 our, our bishop uh, each morning as we're preparing and getting ready, and, and they have, they have uh, the preach word, then they have this dialogue. Uh, I forget what it's called. Uh, you may know uh, uh, what, what they call it. Something called, I don't know if it, it's something, it's, it's a dialogue though. <clears throat> Several people are talking about Young folk, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, young folk, like, you know, in their 20s, in their, in their mid, early to mid 20s. And they're talking through and they're talking about, you know, those, those type of things that are going on. And they're, they're so, in this, this particular time, they were talking on this morning, they were talking about how much time they spend with God. Uh-huh. And they were, they were talking about the fact that church on Sunday is not enough. They were talking about how many of you, if you went to church for an hour, let's just call it two hours. You went to church for two hours, and, 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 but that's all you spent uh, with God. You didn't, you, you know, as the week progressed, as you, as you as stepped into Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday, and you come roll around to Saturday, to Sunday, you have not spent any more time with God in that time frame than you did on the Sunday previously, those two hours, and all the way to the next Sunday. And, and, and if you calculate the time, and if you calculate the hours, the number of hours, I believe it was like 167 hours that, that, that individuals spend uh, uh, in, in, in doing other stuff. And, 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 but you give God two hours. Where does that show God that he is priority? Where does that show God that he matters to you? Where does that show? And I ain't even talking about going to church. I'm just talking about spending time with God. I'm talking about just reading the word every now and then. I'm talking about there's 24 hours in a day. And, 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 and the interesting thing, and it says that most people, listen to this, most people spend at, at, at an average seven hours a day in front of the TV. Seven hours a day. And if we, if we look at that time frame, if we look at that time frame in a seven day time frame, in a seven day period, seven hours a day, you're telling me that you give almost 50 hours of TV time in a week, but you give God two hours on Sunday. And then you complain about that. Ooh, they was long today. Ooh, Jesus. Ooh, we was in service a long time. Two hours. You will sit in a movie theater and watch a movie for two hours, but two hours. Two hours is long. And woo, he was in there for a long time today. But God began to deal with, with, the, with the children of Israel. He said, because you have made idols. You have made idols. I told you, I gave you the land. I brought you out of Egypt. I brought you out of oppression. And I gave you the land and, gave, and, and allowed you to feed those who were in the land. And I gave you the land. And I only said to you, I'm going to be your God. But don't you worship the gods of the, of, uh, 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 I think it's the, um, let, let me go back. I, I don't want to misrepresent it. What it says, he says, he says uh, but I gave you the gods. Uh, he said, but don't worship the gods of the Amalekites. He says, don't worship them. So here, here's the challenge. Here, here's the issue. Here, here's the issue. God had issue with people who worshiped other gods. And so God called Gideon. The angel of the Lord came down to the threshing floor where Gideon was. And so God calls now Gideon. He says, I, I want you to go and I want you to defeat the Midianites. And, and Gideon, who becomes the leader, Gideon says this, this is chapter 6, verse 15. He says this, he says to God, but how can I save Israel? He says, my, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. How am I going to save Israel? Listen, let, let me put it to you in 21st century verbiage. He says, he says, I ain't got no money. He says, I got a little bit, just enough to do what I need to do. I'm not thriving. I'm simply surviving. He says, even in my own family, I'm the black sheep. I am the last to be considered in my family. I'm like David. 
who wasn't even considered or thought of when, when all of the sons were paraded before Samuel. Not even a consideration. And when God said no to all those, then uh, Samuel asked, you got any more sons? What even consider? Gideon says, I am the least in my family. Have you ever felt like you were the least? Have you ever felt like you didn't matter? Have you ever felt like you don't have anything to contribute? Not because God hadn't put it in you, but because the people around you make you feel like you're not worth anything. They make you feel like uh, what you contribute is, is minute and small. You are the least considered in your family. You are the least in your family. And you say, my clan is the weakest in all Manasseh. Listen to this. Gideon was the weakest of the weak and the poorest of the poor. But I want you to understand something because when God counts you in, it does not matter who counts you out. You got to understand that. And when God calls you and he prepares a place for you and he opens the door for you, when God counts you in, it does not matter who counts you out, but you got to get that down in your spirit. You got to get down in your spirit. It does not matter because nothing had changed for Gideon when God called him. Nothing had changed. He was still the least preferred. He was still the one who was from the clan that was the weakest. He was still the one who was not even considered. But God said, I count you and I select you and I picked you. And when God picks you, when he selects you, that is all that matters. I want you to understand something. He knows how to take those <laughs> who are in the back of the room, in the back of the line, who are in last place. God knows how to take those individuals and accelerate their steps and accelerate their movement and bring them from the last place to the first place. I don't know about you, but I've experienced God taking me from the last and bringing me all the way up to the front of the line. I want you to understand when you step into God's purpose and you say yes to what God wants you to do, then the Bible uh, the Bible gives account where he has taken those who are the least preferred, who are not even considered, and brings them to the forefront. How do you take somebody who's watching over some sheep and make them king of all of Israel? I want you to understand how God moves. I want you to understand how God moves. I want you to understand some things about how God moves. And then that helps you understand that you better watch how you treat some people. You better be careful how you handle some folk. Because God's accelerating some people that you have counted out. He's accelerating some people. See, we see the haves and the have-nots. And we discount the have-nots. And we look over the have-nots. And we're all look, already always looking to the haves. But let me tell you something. God is flipping the script. And those who didn't have yesterday, those who used to borrow yesterday, today will become the lenders tomorrow you better be careful how you treat people and don't allow align your treatment of people with what they have you better be careful how you treat people you better be careful how you treat your brother your sister you better be careful i want to read to you first corinthians i want to read this to you real quick uh, chapter 1 verses 26 it says brothers and sisters think of what you were when you were called just, just, just pause right there. Just consider what you were. I, I love God because God doesn't always clean us up and fix us up before he calls us. Oftentimes he calls us in a place where we're destitute, where we're sinking in sin, where we're no good to the kingdom as we are. But God still calls us. He says, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you. Not many of you. I would venture to say not any of us called of God were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were noble of noble birth. But God chose the fool. He chooses the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. Listen to, listen to this. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and, and, and the things that were despised and the things that were not to nullify the things that are. So that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus. Who has become for us wisdom of God. That is our righteousness, our holiness, and our redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let no one who boasts 
Or let the one who boasts, let the one who boasts, let him boast in the Lord. I want you to understand when God calls us, oftentimes we're, we're at the bottom. When he calls us, we've hit rock bottom. When he calls us, we got our backs up against the wall. When he calls us and he uses us, we got to go out and fight 135 soldiers with 300 people. When he calls us. When he calls us, our confession is usually, God, I ain't got nothing. God, why would you call me? God, why do you want to use me? Look at me, God, I ain't got nothing. I'm the least, my clan is the least in Manasseh. I, I, I am the least considered in my family. God, why would you call me? I ain't got nothing. God says, that's just why I call you. One, because you know where you are. Oh, you ain't hear me today. See, some of the challenge why God can't use you because even though you're rock bottom, you act like you're above. You act like everything's fine. You act like and you, you put on a show in a farce that you got everything under control when in fact nothing's under control. But when you go to the Father and you say, Lord, I can't do this. I can't, I can't make it without you. I done messed up so bad. And I've gotten to a place where I can't fix this. And I don't even know what to do. And I'm lost. And, 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 and if you look, and when you get a chance, please read that whole, whole chapter, that whole chapter six. Because it's so, so prevalent and so important to chapter seven. And, and so, so, so you, because you need to understand the backdrop. And so when the Lord calls uh, 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 Gideon, Gideon says, hold on, God. He says, I'll be right back. He said, don't leave. I'll be right back. He says, I'm going to go. I want to go get an offering. I ain't going to ask you for no money. So you ain't got to be afraid. But Gideon says, he says, I'll be right back. And he goes and he dresses the lamb. And I want you to understand, those things were, 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 were so important in that moment. Those things uh, were so, you know, they, they, they didn't have a lot because the Midianites came in and, and, and took all their crop and killed all their cattle. So he says, I'm going to take a lamb. I'm going to take something that's precious to us. And he, and he dressed it up, the Bible says he dressed it, and he brought it, and he gave it, he gave it as uh, an offering to the Lord. The angel of the Lord was there. He told the angel, angel, Lord, don't leave. I'll be right back. I'm going to get an offering. The truth of the matter is, some of us, when God speaks to you, because the angel of the Lord says, you're going you're to be the one who saves Israel. And he said, oh, he, he went all this about what he was not. But he says, you know what, God, if you're going to do it, he said, I'm going to ask you to do a couple things. And he said, I'm going to bring you an offering. And he brings him an offering of something that's precious, of something that's lacking, of something that means a whole de a great deal to he and his family. And he lays it before the Lord. And the Lord consumes it with the fire. And, and, and then he gives, he, uh, Gideon asks him a couple more things. And, I, and please read the chapter because I don't have enough time to go into it. But please read the chapter. And you'll find that Gideon asks him a couple other things to do. He said, I'm going to put a, a flack of wool on the ground and, 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 and I, want you to, I want you to all the ground around it to be, uh, to be dry in the morning from the dew. But that flack of wool, I want it to be wet, sopping wet with the dew. And the Lord does it. He gets up in the morning and he gets the wool and it, he wrings it out. It's soaking wet and all around it is dry. And he says, okay, God, I'm, I'm asking one more thing. He says, tomorrow I want you to make the wool dry, but all the ground around it, I want you to cause dew to fall on the ground around it. So he gets up in the morning and he comes out and he, he sees and ground all around it has dew on it. And he picks up the wool, but the wool is bone dry. And God proves to him and shows him that he can trust, that, that Gideon can trust him. That he's called him. Can I say to you, it's okay. It's all right when you don't know what you don't know. It's okay because, because we have to come out of a place where we have been handled wrongly and where we have been, been completely cast away and we have been, we have not been included and we have been, uh, 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 we, we, we have been put in a place where, where now we feel insignificant to the moment. And so then, so then he just needs his trust to be, to be reestablished in God. He needs his trust to be built up. So he asks God for some things and God does what he asks. And then Gideon goes forward. So, so I want to talk to you. Uh, the, the, the first point, the first point that, I, that, that, that I, I just skipped all over the first point. But the first point in God is uses the right ordinary people to do the right extraordinary things. I, I'm saying this because I want you to understand God uses the right ordinary people. To do the right, extraordinary things. See, we, we used to say God uses the ordinary people to do extraordinary things. But God uses the right, ordinary people. Because there's some folk he wants to use, but you ain't ready yet. 
There's some folk he wants to put his hand on, but he got to keep you in the oven a little while longer. So, 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 so then we transition into the second point. That was the first point. Everything I just said uh, follows that, that first point. Here's the second point. The second point is Gideon's position. I want you to understand the importance of position where God is concerned. Gideon's position. Look at this. Look at this. The Bible says early in the morning, uh, Jerob Baal, that is Gideon, that is Gideon, and all his men camped at the spring or, or uh, uh, the, the, the uh, King James Version says the well of Harad. The well of Harad in the Hebrew means the fountain of trembling. It, it, it means the fountain of trembling. It means that things are occurring to the degree in your life that fear has caused an emotional response. It, it, it means that there is such a great amount and there's a great cloud of fear that, that's over you that it, re, it causes a physical reaction and, 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 and you're trembling. Uh, I'm afraid. You ever, you ever seen folks so afraid that they're trembling uh, that they be, it, it creates, the fear creates a physical response. Some of y'all act like you don't know what I mean, but I'm going to come down your street because some of y'all, while you may not be trembling, you can't sleep and you're walking the floor. You're up in the middle of the night and you're walking the floor because you're afraid of what's getting ready to happen. You're afraid that you can't handle what's going on. You're afraid because you don't see a way out. So you up in the morning and you walk in the floor because you can't sleep. There's some of you all that you all that you're on a uh, 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 what I like to call an involuntary fast. That you ain't volunteered to fast, but you're so fearful and so afraid of what's going to happen that you can't even eat. And so you're on a volunteer uh, involuntary fast where you have turned your plate down and you ain't even hungry. Uh, you, you got some red beans and rice cooking and you got some smell good cooking, but you ain't even hungry. And your folk looking at you like, what's wrong with you? You sick? You don't feel well? You said, no, nah, I ain't just ain't hungry. Yeah, no, you're right. You ain't hungry, but it's not because you're just not hungry. It's because fear has embraced you. So I want you to understand what's happening here. I want you to understand that it, the, the Bible says that, that, that uh, they have found themselves now at the fountain of trembling. It's at that place of the fountain of trembling that he had 32,000 soldiers and the enemy had 135 soldiers. Listen to this. I want you to get this down in your spirit because, because uh, 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 it's interesting how God uses things and what he says to the people. He says to, he says to the Lord said to Gideon, he said, he said uh, uh, go and say this to him. He said, go say this to the army. Make an announcement. Can I, can, I, can I say it the way I want to say it? Go and say this to some of your friends who said they with you. Go and say this to some of your family members who said they with you. He says, go and make this announcement. And he says this. He says, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. Anyone that trembles, anyone that has a physical manifestation of your fear, he says, and 22,000 of them got up and walked away. 22,000 had a physical manifestation of fear. 22,000 had a physical manifestation. What do you mean a physical manifestation? I just told you they were trembling. For some of us, uh, we walked the floor. For some of us, we can't eat. And then for some of us, we make moves. And we do things in the strength of our own hand. And we try to work it out in the strength of our own hand. I just want to know how is that working for you. I just want to know that you come out. I want to know that you save yourself. I want you to understand what's happening here because, because he's, he's dealing with Gideon and he's talking about this position. And you, you, I, I, I'm just, I just need to know if I'm talking to the right crowd today. I just need to know if you can relate to what I'm saying. Have you ever been afraid because you had to face some challenges that seemed to be overwhelming? Some sickness, some hardship. I, I just want to know I'm talking to the right crowd. Some adversity that, that seems to be too much for you to handle. I just want to know if I'm talking to the right crowd. Because I want you to understand that if you're faced at, at 32,000 soldiers, if you're facing 135 
thousand soldiers. Hear me now. Everybody is scared. And anybody that tells you they're not scared, they ain't telling the truth. Everybody's scared. But I want you to understand that God is looking for some courageous people. Because courage, listen to this, courage is the ability to do what needs to be done even in the face of fear. God's looking for some courageous people. He's giving us emotions, but he's not giving us a spirit of fear. But he's giving us emotions and we know how we, we, we understand fear. We understand when things happen and we don't know how they're going to work out. We understand. But what he's looking for are courageous people who can, in the face of fear, still do what needs to be done. <laughs> I want you to, I, I'm talking to people who called for help, but help wouldn't call you back. You know, you call friends and family members and you call folk to help you and, and help wouldn't call you back. You called for help, but help didn't answer the phone. You called for help and you left a message, but help did not call you back. I want you to understand that there's some places and there's some things that God puts you in because God wants to show you how strong he really is and that you can trust him. And there is no power in earth above or below that can beat God, that can match his power, his strength. There is nothing that a uh, 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 devil in hell can do to you that, that he does not have to ask permission for first. I want you to understand that he wants you to get to the place where you understand that your help is in him. Your help is in the Lord. So, so uh, <laughs> it's interesting because they get to this well, the well called uh, the, the fountain of trembling. Uh, Mark, is one thing to be at the well. Mm -hmm. It's something altogether different to drink from the well. See, see, when you find yourself at the well, you got to be careful. You got to be careful what you drink from. See, because once you drink from it, what was once on the outside is now on the inside. You got you to be careful about what you let in to your gate. The, the mouth is a gate. The eye is a gate. The ear is a You got to be careful about what you let in your gates. And they were at the fountain of trembling. And they drunk from the well. And what was on the outside is now. You got to be careful about, about who you listen to. You got to be careful about who you share your dreams with. You got to be careful about, about the people you hang out with that tell you you can't make it and tell you just give up and tell you go find a job and quit your dream. Go find a job and do something else. Don't even worry about that. Don't even consider that anymore. But the Lord has called and he's put a dream in you. He's put a purpose in you. And the Lord says follow after it and go after it even when it looks like it's not happening happening the Lord wants to know sometimes do you believe what he's called you to do do you believe what he's put in you and your pursuit ought to match what you believe and if your pursuit of it does not match what you believe and what God has spoken over your life then I tell God you ain't really even got faith for this the people the people had now come to a place where God would get over this position. They had come to a place and God said, okay, all right, y'all, these 22, these 22,000, you come to a place where now, and this is the third point, now Gideon has a, a dilemma. I, I wonder how many of us don't understand that there are some dilemmas in your life that are caused and created by God. I want you to understand what the dilemma is. A dilemma is the fact that I've got two choices to make. I've got things set before me and I've got to make some choices. And the choices are hard because I don't know which choice is right. But you got to choose one of the choices. And so he says, he gives, he has this dilemma. Because now what's happening is, in this, in this moment, 
The Lord said to Gideon, listen to this, and the people that are with you, I'm reading from the King James Version because I like how, how it says it. The people that are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand. He said, ain't too many for me. He wasn't even talking about a considering, considering Gideon. So, so I want you to understand that. There's some things that God is working out of your life because if he doesn't work those things out of your life, you're going to believe that those things had something to do with you getting where he wants you to be. He's got to work some stuff out of you. I I'm trying to help you understand some things. Uh, 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 there are some people in your life right now who think that the only reason you have what you have is because they're in your life. <laughs> some, some folk simply got this twisted. They got it mixed up. They got me bent. Because you think that you in my life, that, that you're the reason why I am where I am and the reason why I'm going where I'm going. But God says, there's a dilemma because he says, this is the dilemma. The dilemma is you got too many folk with you. The dilemma is you got too many people in your circle, too many people in your camp. You got too many folks talking in your ear. You got too many folk trying to give you instruction and give you direction. And you should be getting your direction from the Lord. Silence the, the noise. Silence the voices. Stop giving people privy to your ear. I want you to understand what God is doing in this season. Because I hear the Lord saying in, the, in this season. Listen, I hear him saying in this next season that I'm removing your dependence on some people that you thought you needed to survive he's not removing the people he's going to remove your dependence on the people you depending on some folk and believing that there's some folk in your life that you they got to have them they got to be there and God says I'm going to show you that I'm the only one that needs to be here the rest of them are ancillary the, an the rest of them are, are if you're coming on that's good but if you come and be quiet where's your come because the only person I need to hear from is God. So he's removing your dependence on some people that you think you needed to survive. The Lord says, I am your source. I am your storehouse. I am Jehovah Jireh, the Lord God who provides and supplies all your needs. He says, I'm the only one that you got to have. Everybody else you can do with or you can do without. So but he's got this dilemma. He says, so now announce to the army, all those who tremble, turn back, go home. All those who are afraid, you got some folk in your circle that's more scared of where you're going than you are. And they impress upon you their fear. Did you understand? I want you to understand this in this dynamic. I want you to understand this. You ever got around people who are so positive and so people who, some people who are so energetic that you feel their energy. You feel their positivity. You feel they, 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 they motivate you to want to be better. They motivate you to want to do better. It's like having a good workout partner, a partner who, who, who goes at it and goes after it, makes you go at it and go after it, makes you heighten uh, uh, your focus and heighten uh, uh, your, 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 your effort to, uh, to exercise and get better and do better. Uh, I want you to understand understand that you know those people and you've experienced those people but in, in, in like manner also the folk who are afraid and they scared they, they, they don't want you to go because they don't want you to take them they're afraid of going where you're going they're afraid of going where you're going and you be careful about the people that you have in your circle and those that you're taking with you because they are fearful of going where you're going because the truth of the matter is if I'm not successful uh, 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 and you become successful the light shines on me a little brighter but if both of us never reach our goal misery loves company and if I'm going to be a failure I want to fail by myself you be careful about the people that you have in your circle. That his dilemma was, his dilemma was now, God, you, God, what are we supposed to do with these 10,000 people? What are we supposed to do with these 10,000 people? You worried about the 10,000 that's left, and God says that's still too many people. 
I'm talking about divine count. I'm talking about the people that God says that you that you are taking with you to accomplish what he desires to accomplish such that they know that it was not by their strength and not by their hand. But this is only by the power of our God. So I want you to understand. So so he announces to the 32. God removes 21,000 in one announcement. I told you. They were at the. The fountain of trembling and 22,000 people. The Bible says it. Look, look what the Bible says. Look what he says to him. He says this. He says, he says, anyone who trembles, <laughs> he says, make this announcement. Anyone who trembles with fear, anyone that's, that's had a cup from this well, anyone that's that had a drink of this Kool-Aid, See, there's some folk around you that, that have, 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 have had a, a drink of the world and, 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 and they believe that, well, you know, it, it all just come easier than this. And, you know, uh, uh, we can try it a different way. And, you know, we can, we, I connect you with Pookie and Ray Ray and, and they can help you out because, you know, they got some, they got the hookup. Stop looking for the hookup. Stop looking for the easy way. Stop looking for the easy way and look for God's way. So he's got... This is his dilemma because now 22,000 are gone and God is still saying to him that you still got too many. Lord, well, what, do you, what do you want me to do, God? Well, I mean, what you, what you want me to do? Uh, God, I, I, I'm down to, to 10,000. You're saying that's too many. He says, I'm going to tell you what to do because, see, I can see now. I can see now I got to take over. God says, I can see now I've got to, I've got to do some things because I can see that, that you're having some issue. I can see. That I've got to take over in this process. So this is what God says. So the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many. He says, take them down to the water. <laughs> and he says, and I will thin them out for you there. He says, I can't leave it up to you no more because, because see, you don't even have faith enough to believe that I, the truth of the matter is I can do it with one man. The truth of the matter is I can bring the spirit of Samson upon somebody and slay them all. But I want you to understand that, that God says, I'm going to take you out of the process because see, your faith is not even large enough for you to keep going and pursuing and moving forward in the thing that I've called you because you think you need all that surrounds you to perform what I've said to do. So he says, I'm going to take you out the process. He says, take them down to the water. He says, take them down to the water. Oh, it's interesting, Stephen, because this is the, this is the, the, the fourth point. And this, this fourth, fourth point is, is God's count process. <laughs> uh, you know, it's interesting because, you know, you know uh, our numbers and God's numbers don't usually match up, Co-Pastor. Our, our numbers and God's numbers and what we count and, and what God counts is, is, is not normally what, to, it doesn't match up to the same thing. You know what I mean? Because, you know, you count some folk, you know, and, and the truth of the matter is you can't count everybody you can count. Let me say that one more time. You can't, own, you can't count on everybody that you can count. You cannot count on everybody that you can count. Just because they're there don't mean you can count on them. It just means they're present right now. The truth of the matter is that you cannot count on everybody that you can count. So God says, because you don't know that, because you don't understand that, the truth of the matter is, there's some people that you bring along with you that if you're not careful, there'll be a detriment to where you're going instead of a help and a benefit. So he says, he says, hold on. He says, he says I got I to gotta take you to a place where you understand uh, uh, that, 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 that what I'm doing is what I'm doing. And, and it's my process and it's, and it's what's needed uh, to show my strength. And so I got to move you from the equation because now I, I see that your faith is not big enough. So he says, take them down to the water. And he says, I'm going to thin them out. I, li I like how the King James says it because he says, the Lord said to Gideon, the people are too many. Bring them down to the water and I will try them for you there. You say, I'm going to put some folk around you. Here's some folk getting ready to leave you because they say, listen, I can't be associated and, and, and attached to you because I'm going through stuff uh, simply because you're going through stuff. And they'll leave because God tries them at, at, right at the place where you get ready to get your breakthrough. He says, I'm going to try them there. And it shall be that whom I say unto you, this, these shall go with you. And the same shall go with you. And whoever I say uh, unto you that this, that these shall not go with you, the same shall not go. 
But God takes them through a process. And if you open up your ears, the challenge with some of us is that we don't know how to hear from God. We don't know how to hear God's voice. And God says, don't do it. He says, don't take these people. Don't tell these people nothing. Don't tell them what you're going, where you're going. Don't tell them what you're doing. Don't even tell them what you think about. Don't tell them what I put in your heart to do. And the truth of the matter, he says, if I tell you, take them with you, then take them with you. But if I say to you, don't take them with you, then don't take them with you. The challenge for many of us is that we don't hear God. That we don't know his voice. That we don't spend time with him. That we don't pray. So it's interesting that God says this. This is what God says, and I'm almost done. God says, uh, but the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will test them there. That it be that whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, the same shall go with you. And whomever I say to you, this one shall not go with you, the same shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water. And the Lord said to Gideon, everyone who laps from the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set apart by himself. Likewise, who, who, uh, everyone who, who gets down on his knees and drinks, and the number of those who lapped, putting their hand in their mouth, was 300. He divides them. Now, for most of us, if I got 7,700 on this side, who kneeled down, and I got 300 on this side who lapped like a dog. They kneeled down and drank the water. And they cupped the water and they lapped like a dog. It's interesting because, because as I begin to look at that, as I begin to dig down a little bit to understand clearly what was taking place and the difference between lapping, cupping the water and lapping like a dog and in drinking, putting on your knees in drinking. So as I begin to look at the word drink, and I begin to look at uh, uh, the different types of drink, the different types of drink that we do. We drink from a cup, and we sip from the cup. We, we drink from a straw, and we suck the water from a straw. But when you get down on your knees and you have to drink uh, from a pool, a large pool that does not have a rim, Hear me now, like a cup has a rim, or a bowl has a rim, but a large pool of water, you have to suck the water up out of the large vast deposit of water and you have to suck it up so as i began to look at what god was doing what god was saying he says he says we have some lepers he says we have some lepers and we have some suckers we got some lepers some lappers lappers they lap it up but then we also have some suckers who suck it up a dog laps water it's interesting because a dog laps water. A dog is, you know, a good dog is a dog who will fight for you. You got a good dog. He will, uh, somebody comes in your house, a good dog will attack if somebody comes in and tries to do something to you. But, but leeches suck. He said we got some lappers and we got some suckers. And God says, though we have 7,000 700 suckers and 300 lappers, those suckers will drain you of your life source. They'll suck the life right out of you where these 300 lappers lapping like a dog will fight for you and they will be with you. So who would you rather have? 7,700 suckers or 300 lappers? Too many of us because they kneel down and they look spiritual, but they suck in the life out of you. We'll select and pick the suckers and leave the lappers, the ones who will fight for you by themselves. It doesn't matter if you have 7,700 suckers with you. If you don't have one that'll fight for you, you're still all by yourself. But you got 300. And so God says, sin the suckers home. <laughs> Tell somebody I'm sending the suckers home today. I'm sending the suckers home. I'm sending the suckers home today. Those who have drained me and have, have depleted me. Those who have sucked the life out of me. Those who continue to take and take and take and they never add. I'm sending the suckers home and I'm going with the lappers. So here's my final point and I'm done. My final point is that you're going to have to be okay with fighting with who's left. And you're going to have to be okay with it, understanding that God is on your side. 
And because God is for you, he is more than those that are against you. It's difficult and it's challenging. And God does not count like we count. We count numerical. And we, the, the larger the number, the better we feel. And God says, you got too many with you. You got too many on your side that have a form and a fashion of godliness. You got too many who say they're with you, but they're really just draining you and sucking the life out of you. You got too many with you who are hurting you and you don't even know you're being hurt. You got too many that when you hang out with them and you leave, you feel like I feel drained. I feel like I just need to go lay down for a minute because I just feel like the life has been sucked out of me. That's because you got too many suckers and not enough lappers. And you've got to be willing to fight with who's left. Trust God to put your circle together. Trust God to put those folk you're fighting with shoulder by with shoulder. Trust God. And the Bible tells us that Gideon had great victory over the Midianites. With 300 men, God gave him the victory. How do you have victory? With 300 men against 135,000 soldiers. How do you have victory? You can only have victory with God. Can I say this to you? That God understands. God understands what's happening. And he understands that it even looks insurmountable to you. He is not unmindful of that. And, and when God told Gideon to go down to the many nights, he says, but if you're afraid, he says, go close enough to hear the word of the Lord. And he went close enough and he heard the word of the Lord come. And the people say that Gideon is bringing an army and it's going to defeat. He didn't, he didn't announce it. The people spoke it and they spoke it close enough for him to hear. Sometimes all you need to be is encouraged. Sometimes all you need to know is the word of the Lord. If God said it, he's going to do it. If he spoke it, he shall indeed come to pass. There are some of us that are right now in a place, and you're in a hard place, and it looks like there's no help for you, or the help seems to be too small to conquer and overcome or, or, or the insurmountable situation and task at his hand. At the end, the Lord says, all you really needed was me. I'm just bringing this little 300 folk around just to make you feel better. Because the truth of the matter is, most of us in that situation would not have enough faith to trust and believe God to go into battle all by yourself with God alone. But we're coming to a place and God is saying that I'm going to give you the victory. The Lord says the victory was yours already. The victory was yours when you decided to allow me to select the circle that would go with you. God has already fought the battle for you. He's just wanting you to make sure that you set the places and the pieces in place such that when you go and get the victory, the glory belongs to him. Divine count is not about the number of people that go. Divine count is about letting God select those people to go with you. Divine count it's not about the number and the amount of people that go with you. The divine count is about allowing God to select and pick and choose those individuals that go with you into the victory. Everybody can't go into victory with you. Because there are some people that will go with you. And as you're stepping into victory, behind you and behind your back, there comes a knife to stab you in your back. You can't take everybody with you. What God says and what God determines, trust that. You in the, some of you are in a dilemma right now because God says, I set before you life and death. He says, choose life. God, you're in the dilemma right now because God has said to you that, that this is, these are the people that I've chosen for you, this and no more. And you look and you say, God, I didn't know. And God says, I can reduce it if you like. Because really, all you need is God. I trust that this word has encouraged you today. I trust 
that you have, you understand that God's numbers are not your numbers. That what God wants to do oftentimes, hear me now, does not require a whole bunch of folk. What God wants to do, how do I know that? Because he chose 12 men to continue the work after the Lord Jesus Christ, after his ascension back to the Father, he chose him, set 12 men in to continue the work. It doesn't take a lot. And it's these are those who have turned the world upside down. I wonder how many people are standing with you today and God can say that these are those who will turn the world upside down. 